it's just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Kyle Fagula all the way from Germantown, Tennessee. He is the owner and orthodontist at Saddle Creek Orthodontics with two locations in Germantown and Colorville, Tennessee. Dr. Fagula graduated from the University of Tennessee in 2013 with a certificate in orthodontics and a master's degree in dental science for his thesis on three-dimensional imaging of the airway. Dr. Fagula is the course director and lecturer of development of the occlusion, a class for first-year dental students at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. He is also co-founder of the digital marketing agency, Neon Canvas, host of the web series, The Digital Orthodontist, and key opinion leader for 3M Oral Care and Comet Burrs. He loves music, specifically the drums, and spends more time than he should on social media. Dr. Fagula and his wife, Anna, and their three children, Charlie, Libby, and George, live in Germantown and attend Highland Church of Christ. Now, you must have had a few jokes on the playground when you were little <laughs> with the last name Fagula. How, how, did, how did that play out on the playground? Yeah, the funny thing is, I went to real small, and thanks for having me on the show, Howard. Uh, the funny thing is, when you're a kid, you don't really know that it's embarrassing, uh, and you slowly sort of put it together. Uh, and I went to a really small private school in Paragold, Arkansas. So there was like 27 in my graduating class. And so you know everyone from kindergarten to senior year, basically. So I guess I didn't really get made fun of it as much. But then hitting college and certainly dental, dental school, it's sort of the uh, prevailing thing. And people, my one-liner is people always ask me, you know, what, what is that? Like, what, what, what is Fagula? And I say, it's unfortunate. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, but, uh, but uh, I think uh, like a Northern Italian maybe is what I've read. Like uh, beech trees are there and it's like Fagacea is the uh, Latin. So I've tried to figure it out, uh, but it's really, it's just kind of an odd name. But I'm the only, I think, Dr. Fagula who's a dentist or orthodontist. So there's that. You know? Well, yeah. I mean, having a unique name, I, I had a classmate in dental school named Dave Smith and he used to say to You're his right. mom, Really, Mom? Really? My right. last name's right. Smith, so you had to go with Dave? And I remember right. several times at a bar, uh, when you when you hand them the ID, Dave Smith, the bartender, was like, okay, I know this is a fake ID. And he's right. like, hey. <laughs> Yeah, that's why you go with McLovin when you have a, have a fake ID, McLovin. So, I don't know if you haven't seen Superbad. So, anyway, yeah, no, it's it's interesting name. There's a reason, though, I, I name my practice Saddle Creek Orthodontics and not Fagala Orthodontics. Uh, and, I, and I go by Dr. Kyle, just to make it easier. Well, you know, I, I, I call this dentistry – oh, by the way, my, uh, my fag joke is uh, when I, I worked very hard in, in, uh, to get my FAGD, you know, five years, 500 hours, and I got my FAGD, and I put it on my car, and I put it everywhere in the dental office, and the first person I ever mentioned was that 80-year-old lady. She says, I, I see that you're a fagda. I, I have a friend who's a fag, and I thought, really? Oh, that, that, that was my only – my only feedback from that alphabet soup was that she had a friend that was a fagda. Um, yeah, good, you, you good know, internal marketing. <laughs> uh, but the unique name is neat. I mean, they, they, I think the sure. best marketers are the uh, prescription drug medications. They always, uh, the, the earliest letters are used the most. So they always go to the back of the alphabet yeah. and find a word with a Z or an X or a B. Um, Xerox is made that way. They were, they were informed. To go come up with a word that didn't exist, you don't have to, yeah. you know, then you, then you can get the website, the copyright, the, you know, and, and, uh, and I like the fact that Ferran, um, there's only like 86 Ferrans in the whole United States, so it's very, very unique. Yeah, and, nice, uh, nice. Yeah, so, so this is Dentistry and Censor, so I like to talk about everything, uh, I don't want to talk about anything everyone agrees on, and you, <laughs> um, I, w- I want to talk about where the controversy is. And you are uh, you wrote a thesis on three dimensional imaging of the airway, and there's two components to that. Number one, let's just start with three dimensional imaging. Um, some people are saying, you know, orthodontics, you can do that with a pan and a SF all day long with a lot less radiation. And are we using too much radiation on little kids for a 3D, which might not really give us that much extra oomph and all? That is the controversy. Do you agree that that's a con- first of all? Do you agree? But that's a yeah. concern from people. Yeah, I think that's a controversy. I mean, it might surprise you. I did my thesis on that, and I feel like I understand that world pretty well. There's people who understand it better than I do, for sure. I actually saw you were at the Henry Schein meeting. There's some guys in that group that really understand 3D a lot better and airway a lot better than I do. Um, but I don't practice with one. I, I don't have one. I think it's cost prohibitive. I started my practice from scratch, and I could not afford a $120,000 iCat. Um, it's a great machine. I do think, uh, for what it's worth, that it's a little overkill 
for most kids, and I think that really the thesis that I did, which it's a thesis, it's not like it's groundbreaking research, but my conclusion was is that there's only so much you can tell by taking the volume of an airway. I think there's a lot more that goes into uh, you know, apnea issues or airway issues. And I think you talk to anyone who really understands that uh, and they'll kind of give that up. And so, you know, it, it comes down to the the, the tissues and, and how tense they are. And a lot of things that happen when you're sleeping, when you're sitting there and you're getting a, you know, an ICAT image on a kid, you know, they're sitting up, they're not lying back and there's just a lot, they're awake. There's tons of things. So I think it's cool, but I think a pan and Ceph is a lot less on, you know, the micro sieverts levels and um, although there's new machines, I think the new iCat Flex, uh, they say that it's actually fewer micro sieverts than a Pan and Ceph, a traditional digital Pan and Ceph. And so I guess I could go either way on that. I think that honestly, the amount of radiation is so little. I tell people it's about the same as what you'd get on a weekend sitting inside your home. And yet it's still, you know, it's the Alara principle. It's as low as reasonably acceptable. So I think we, it need, we need to be seeking just like everything with dentistry to do you know, the least damage possible. Um, but I don't know that it's the end of the world. And yet I don't use it. Was that like a political answer? I don't know. Well, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a leader and these dentists yeah. don't realize that when they get into a bunch of debt, that, that turns into a lot of stress and a lot of overhead. And I, I applaud you that you're an orthodontist and had enough self-esteem and knowledge that said, I can practice <laughs> ortho without a damn $120,000 x-ray machine. Just because yeah. they sell a big, expensive, shiny object, um, the, these yeah. dentists, I mean, it's like, um, well, it, it's a human phenomenon. Warren Buffett always says that 95% of the CEOs in the Fortune 500 go to work every day to learn how to complicate everything more and, and, and spend those profit dollars. Instead of giving them to the stockholders, they find ways to blow all the money. And he sure. says only 5% of the CEOs actually go to work every day and say, how can we do this faster, cheaper, easier, and higher quality? And it's got to do yeah. all those four things. And dentists always forget the cheaper. And they say, my gosh, I could get into $300,000 more debt if I started scanning my teeth impressions instead of taking an impression material, milling them out chair side, and doing it with a three-dimensional x-ray machine. Okay, well, now you just doubled your student loan debt. Sure. Yeah. What, was, no, what I, was wrong with Emperor gum and sending it to the lab? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm probably closer to that opinion than the, the opinion that everything has to be digital and high tech. I mean, I have an iTero scanner. I've got a 3D printer, so we do some of that. But I mean, 3D printers, you're talking $3,500 for a form too. So that to me is in the, the realm of what's reasonable. And then for scanning, we, you know, we're doing a lot of Invisalign. We do all of our appliances digitally. It cuts down on the number of appointments. So for me, it became that break point of, I do think this will provide for us, you know, more productivity uh, and profitability. But I think when you first get out, you could actually use a, an analog X-ray machine. I mean, I don't know why you couldn't. You can basically get those for free. So um, it's the, it's the number one thing I would probably say to a graduating dental student. Certainly, one that opens their own practice is you don't need everything to be nice and shiny. You can get old chairs, you can refinish them, you can repaint them. Uh, so we saved, well, we got used chairs when we opened our office. So we got seven chairs and they were all used and saved a ton of money, thousands of dollars. Um, but I would say this of the three dimensional stuff. Uh, you never know what you don't know. And I, and I would accept that there's a lot I don't know about what you can do with a cone beam. And so, I, you know, with caution, I would say, I don't think it's necessary, but I don't really know. And as far as those claims about all the radiation, re remember that pharmaceutical companies usually spend as much on advertising as they do on R and D. So a lot of those, uh, a lot of those new drugs and new equipment and all those claims were usually uh, invented in the marketing department. Uh, you know, so uh, so you yeah. know, if you're if you're an American, I mean, Americans are the most cynical people. I mean, I've been around the world. There's no one. There's no one more cynical than an American because we we live here. We yeah. know that when that man, whatever that man is saying, he's just trying to steal your wallet. Yeah. You know. Sure. I'm, I mean. I mean. Yeah. Sure. And well, I and I'll I think ask, you, I'll ask you this. Yeah. In, in, in Tennessee, if a hundred women went to get their oil changed with a twenty nine dollar coupon, <laughs> and a hundred times out of a hundred, a man walks down and says, "Well, you really need to change your air filter." What percent sure. of the women suspect bullshit? I uh, probably a hundred percent and then probably 93% get it, you know, <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I mean, it's, and you got, I feel very, that I have to guard against that with orthodontics because, you know, you get like anytime you get a dad actually coming to a consult, which is about one in 30, maybe in the orthodontic world, you always get the question, or at least 95% of the time you get the question, well, is this medically necessary? Do we have to do this? You know, cause dads are looking for an excuse to not do it. Whereas moms are like, well, my baby needs this, you know? Um, 
And it's it's really easy to want to give reasons and create reasons whereby orthodontics is medically necessary. And the truth is, is that orthodontics is typically just a cosmetic benefit. It's an aesthetic thing. It's, uh, you know, it's something that we do because we're a first world country and we can afford to do it and we look better. And that brings with it, you know, lots of benefits. But like who really needs it? You know, I mean, who really has to have it, I guess. And so I think when you've got 3D technology and you're looking for a reason to justify the purchase, you might be apt to use it to justify, well, this is going to open the airway and this is going to make the breathing better and things like that. Again, I'm not an expert on it, but I think that that's used more times than not. Like, well, you've got an overbite, and as we correct that, it'll open the airway. And in that little study I did for my thesis, what we found is that class twos and ones were no different on average in terms of volume and area and area of minimum constriction and all these sort of things that you can measure that I see people circle and say, well, look at how narrow it is here. Um, now, clinically, is there a difference in a sleep study? Maybe. Um, but I just, I think it's really easy to want to use our tools to justify why our treatment of choice is necessary. Um, and I think honesty is something, I wouldn't say we're losing it, but I think what you talk about with marketing people is we allow them to speak for our profession more than we should. Um, and their job is to sell sell stuff. So, you know, that's, that's their golden god, you know? Yeah, and um, big pharma, um, I mean... Uh drug ads 5.2 billion a year and rising i mean during the during the last year's super bowl i mean all all everybody you said who won the game i'm not sure but uh i think uh i'm gonna <laughs> take this new drug for an irritable bowel syndrome and toenail <laughs> fungus the and, toenail um, fungus was the worst yeah <laughs> and and it's um it's pretty um amazing that nine out of ten big pharma companies spend more on marketing than r and I mean that's yeah that's yeah. uh I mean, that's just, well, just, I it's, mean, it's that's just crazy. Crazy. And I think the only major dental company that has understood that is, has been Invisalign. And they understood that marketing an idea to a consumer is more powerful than trying to prove something to a dentist. Uh, and so you might say that we're fickle and hard to you know, get to come around, but a consumer is a little bit easier to market to. So then you have them coming in and asking for the product and pushing it. And you've seen what Invisalign stock's done the last few months. I mean, it's incredible. Well, I'm very proud of Invisalign because um, in my 30 years since graduation, you know, most all your major brands were already existing. You know, Crest, Colgate, Listerine. That was the uh, the new brand uh, built in my lifetime that is a household name from here to Cambodia mm -hmm. to Malaysia to Soweto, the whole planet understands Invisalign. But before yeah. we start talking about treating Invisalign, that course that you teach in, covers anthropology and i see the big um the big um thing now you know the millennials want to prevent disease they, they're, right. they're not hoping for a cure for lung cancer they're just not going to smoke uh they're not going to eat twinkies and cheetos and then hope they don't get uh you know sick they're, they're, they're trying to prevent diabetes not find the better cheaper faster insulin dispenser and right now the thing that um lots of millennials are reading about is that malocclusion is a very recent phenomena with uh, mm -hmm. Homo sapien, and when you go back, I mean, on on today, flying around the uh, um, on the news is that they found uh, 130,000 year old uh, Neanderthal teeth in near Croatia, and it had dental work, and uh, so this is factual wow. evidence that people that Neanderthal number one, it, he must have been smarter than we thought. Uh, right. Because they thought he was less smart because he was uh, extinct by Homo sapien. Uh, my my first thought was, does that mean the world's oldest profession just got dethroned <laughs> and now dentists have just replaced uh, um, the Prostitute. ladies of the evenings, uh, the Mary Magdalene's? <laughs> I think we we just kicked the prostitutes right off. That's their, great. Off yeah. their winner's yeah. cage. We are now the gold medalists of the world's oldest profession. But my question is this. How come when they find Neanderthal, <laughs> Cro-Magnum, Peking Man, how come when they find all those groups, they don't have these yeah. malocclusions? And now yeah. when you go yeah. to Phoenix and Memphis, they're everywhere. Why? And I think the next move in orthodontics isn't going from 2D to 3D or and all this is going to be starting to say, why the sapien now modern man have all this malocclusion? Is it the binky? Is it thumb sucking? Is it going from uh, throwing your daughter... Uh, a bone of a mastodon and she has to chew on it for an hour and a half versus now she's eating applesauce out of a jar of uh, Gerber baby food. You see it when they, when they just have just the mildest difficulty nursing uh, mom switches to a bottle and a sippy cup. I mean, there's just like this child is going to consume three times as many calories without putting any forces on his face. What do you think that's what it is? 
less force. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you brought this up because we talk about this at length, and I think it's one of the more interesting concepts is that people don't realize that malocclusion is recently a new thing. I mean, it's about 100 years plus or minus old. Um, and so there's a few things that we talk about in the class, and one of them, as you alluded to, is mastication. Uh, we have a softer diet now than we've ever had. And so they've done studies with monkeys where they've given them a soft, like, fudge-like diet versus uh, a harder diet. And they've compared that then to monkeys in the wild. And as you might expect, the ones with the softer diet, they have narrower maxillas. Uh, you know, their jaws don't develop as much. So when they kill the monkeys and then they weigh their mandibles, their maxillas, they weigh less. And so there's just less development. As you would assume, I mean, muscles build bones in, in a sense. And so the more mastication, the more force required to eat, the more development of the jaws. And with that would come the more development of the upper jaw, the more space for the teeth to fit within the dental arch. And so that makes sense. Like we get that. Um, but what do we eat all the time? What do most kids uh, feast on these days? It's McDonald's, it's Taco Bell. You could almost eat that with a straw. Um, and so that would be like the, the big, like major change. Other one would be chronic mouth breathing. And so if you're not breathing through your nasal passage, your upper jaw is not going to develop to the same degree. And so anytime, not anytime, but most times where you see a kid with bilateral posterior crossbite, narrow, narrow maxilla, high vault, they don't breathe through their nose. And so it could be combined with a lot of things. One of those being uh, we live in cities more now than we do in rural areas. Um, and so we're around each other. And so we've sort of traded these diseases 100 years ago, like polio and yellow fever and things like that, for obesity and um, just being surrounded by each other, more allergies, things like that. And so there's a lot more that could be said by smarter people, um, but it's the way that we choose to live. So millennials, which I technically am a millennial, that actually came out this week. They're calling, uh, I think, Xennials. It's like Generation X to millennials, I think like 77 to 83, I'm 84, uh, but I think I'm more, I don't really feel like a millennial, but if one of the things about millennials is trying to, you know, prevent disease by living better, I think I'll take that. I think that's good. I just don't know how much you can do because are you going to ever really convince families to not eat McDonald's when they have kids? Um, and are you, are you ever going to convince people to move out of the city and live out in the rural areas? Um, so it's one of those things where it's a disease of civilization and yet we're not going to give up on civilization. So I don't know. But I think there's some things. There's smart parents that could probably figure out ways around this. Uh, I would say it's not vaccines, Howard. That would be the one thing I would say. Um, but why But why do um, modern people – why does modern man breathe through their no, mouth more than Cro-Magnum and Neanderthal? Um, I mean that, that would be – a question. I mean, it's it's sort of all one and the same. I mean, the narrower the maxilla, I would assume that would cause for more nasal breathing issues. Um, something about low tongue posture and how that's all interconnected. Um, so we see, you know, see a lot of open bites. I mean, allergies. I mean, I, again, it, these are not. These is kind of speaking outside of my area of expertise, but it would seem that the more people you put closer together, the more apt they are to develop. Uh, allergies and things like that. Uh, we're also we also exercise less. We work less. I'm actually reading a great book by uh, Ben Sass. It's called The Vanishing American Adult. And it talks about how we have institutionalized school to the extent that kids don't work younger. And so, in a mostly agrarian you know industry, I think 90% of people were farmers before like 1850 or something. Uh, kids were working at seven, eight, nine, ten. They weren't sitting around playing video games, and getting fat. And as we get fat, it's harder to breathe through our nose, more mouth breathing. If we're eating McDonald's, we're not working our teeth out so on and so forth. We're also keeping our teeth longer. So when you find like an old skull, there's one called like American Glory, which most uh, occlusion you know, concepts are built on. And it's in perfect occlusion. It's got third molars in. Everything fits in. Uh, at that time, they were going to be eating rougher foods. They weren't cooking foods through. So it was, you know, raw meat and things like that. Uh, you know, I just, I think things are just different. We're, we're as different as we've ever been over the past hundred years. I mean, those changes have been astronomical. And I think that's one of the things that we see. And but, you know, you know, know uh, progress is always uh, two steps forward, one step back. I think it's funny right now yeah. how the the biggest success we had for longevity, without a doubt, the last century was simply vaccines and clean water and toilets, and getting clean water in without cholera, getting your waste material out, and vaccines. And here we are, uh, seventeen years into the new century, and by this time last century, we already would have had. The Spanish influenza, which killed 50 million people, 5% of the world's population. But now it seems like the anti-vaccination movement is bigger. <laughs> and big. I, I, see, yeah. I see the vaccination and the water fluoridation movement 
I mean, just the 30 years I've been here in Phoenix, I mean, every third woman that's pregnant that you talk to is um, struggling with what pediatrician to go to because she's not letting them vaccinate their, their kid or yeah. she's concerned about it, you know. So. Well, and that, that comes back to this idea earlier of honesty. Uh, as doctors, we have to be honest. We can't let people like Big Pharma or people marketing to us set the standard. And so you have the vaccine thing started by a quack doctor that writes an article with a sample size of 12, and he starts this movement, and people you know catch on to it. And even Dr. Sears' son, Dr. Sears is a real famous medical doctor. His son's a pediatrician and has written a book about vaccines. And uh, you know he he's kind of perpetuating this myth that vaccines are – an issue and maybe to spread them out or slow them down or things like that. Um, and it's just, you know, when there's a, a community built around, when you write books, you get paid, you get to speak and there's an interest, there's a vested interest, uh, to make money off of saying things that maybe aren't true or that aren't supported by research. Uh, that's, that's a slippery slope. It's dangerous. Um, so, I mean, the vaccine, there's a really cool special on this on John Oliver's show uh, last week, tonight, this past weekend, Oh, and, we uh, are two peas yeah. in a pod. Love that show. You watch that show? Yeah. yeah there's, been, there's been more measles outbreaks in the one Somalian Minnesota. community than all of America for last year. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's sad. I mean, you got people dying. I mean, they were talking about in France. I don't know what the disease was there. Uh, maybe it was some malaria or something. But they had stopped. You know, vaccine rates went down and herd, immuni- immun- uh, herd immunity went down. And so then there was like six people who died. I think it went from like... 200 infected to like 15,000 or something in a few years. And so, yeah, it's, it's dangerous. But the thing is, if you want to Google something, you want to find your truth and your echo chamber, it's there somewhere. And it's kind of scary. So <laughs> tell me about your journey where you were um, an orthodontist. You're successful. You have Saddle Creek Orthodontics in Memphis, uh, by the way. Um, and, and for my homies, they're, they're all driving to work right now. So I, what yeah. I do is so they can find you without stopping and taking notes, I retweet your last uh, Twitter. So I uh, have retweeted. Uh, I'm, they go to at Howard Ferran. And okay. um, so then I uh, – let me see this profile. Try uh, to think, I hope my last tweet was something good. It probably it was, wasn't. Uh, it was for Memphis Braces. So you're um, at Memphis Braces, and I retweeted Transformation right. Tuesday. Marquisha oh, had go. an absolutely gorgeous smile now thanks to braces and those adorable dimples. That was an amazing before and after picture. She's a beautiful woman. Thanks, man. And then the, the last one before that was uh, Neon Canvas. And yeah. uh, I thought that was interesting. So you have um, ne- at Neon Canvas, a digital marketing boutique. And I retweeted your, uh, your pin tweet. When we design a website for a client, people say it's the best ortho website they've ever seen. Um, now, uh, is Neo Canvas, is that just digital marketing for just orthodontists or is it for general dentists? And talk about your journey. How do you go from an orthodontist who has no time because he's raising uh, three children, Charlie, Libby, and George, and then start a Neon Canvas? Tell us what that was all about. Uh, well, first off, your video has frozen. So I know your son told me if there was something like that, just to ask Thanks. you. Hang and on. We'll, maybe we'll, get just, we'll call you right back right now. Just two seconds. Okay, sure. Well, Microsoft bought it. So uh, Skype for $8.9 billion, So you know it'll just have oh. nothing but bugs. Now they just bought LinkedIn. I'm wondering <laughs> how fast it will take uh, Microsoft to ruin LinkedIn. Yeah, it was already ruined, so I don't know. Um, sorry, not a LinkedIn fan. Why aren't you a LinkedIn fan? What, what do you not like about it? It just doesn't fit. I mean – I guess for what I'm doing and what I'm trying to accomplish, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think if I were in the financial world, uh, I have a lot of friends that are in real business to business world. It makes sense. But for me, it just, it, there's no utility to it. It seems like people are. Because, because you're saying that you're in the B2C world, you're, you're trying to use LinkedIn to attract customers um, to your orthodontic office and it's really more a B2B world. For me, like pro- professional growth and networking is happening better and more interestingly on Facebook. Uh, so inside groups and closed groups. And I just feel like LinkedIn to me feels like MySpace felt eight years ago. Like it just feels like its time has passed. That's why I was so shocked they bought it. I, I don't, I mean, I, I understand the value in it and I'm not, I'm just not their target demo. It's just one of those sites when I get on, I'm like, this, this stinks. Like I don't like any of this. And some people love LinkedIn. So, you know. Take it for what it's worth. I love Twitter, and some people hate Twitter. So, um, well, Twitter's good because if you can get to five million followers, you can you can have the White House. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, well, I that's mean, really, right. That was a disruptive after technology. That. I mean, I, I think the funniest thing sure. is what was that guy's Anthony Weiner? He he's he's yeah. uh, if they never would have invented Twitter, he'd still have a job. I mean, how, how would you well like to, he how would have found, he would have found a way to screw it up. I think uh, you know Anthony Weiner. He he continues to screw it up. He you know even recently they gave him a show like a reality show and he was kind of building himself back up and then he did another thing and I, I can't remember what it was exactly, but he's he's back on the poo poo list. He was yeah. emailing some something and but what was in, interesting oh. about trump is that instead of he he disintermediated the middleman i mean everybody's been yep. doing that in economics they want to buy straight from the manufacturer to amazon to your house they want yep. to try to get rid of the middleman and instead of going through um journalists he just tweets direct and yeah. and, and, I, it, and i think it, it's funny how everybody says he's going down he's going to get impeached it's all over and they've had four elections since the white house and the republicans are four and zero and I think yeah. a lot of, you know, Fred Joyle always says everything is marketing. And I think uh, I think his direct qu- connection to five million Twitter followers. And also what I what I don't like about uh, Facebook is uh, you post something on Facebook. You, you have no idea who's going to see it on your feed. Uh, sure. they, they just they have all these algorithms decide what they're going to push out. Whereas you send out a tweet on Twitter. Uh, I, and, and I and I can prove this because think about this. I have three hundred thousand followers on Facebook.com at Howard Fram. And I only wow. have 20,000 followers on Twitter. And I'll send out, I'll make a post on Dentaltown and a post on Facebook and a post on Twitter. And that Twitter is just a feedback, just boom, in your face right now. Yeah. Where Facebook just kind of slowly dribbles across. And if you really want any feedback, you got to boost your post and give them a Benjamin. And, and even if you <laughs> give them a Benjamin... The, uh, you'll, you'll still only get 100,000 views. For me to actually get all 300,000 views on a post on Facebook, I have to give them $300. It's basically, so what is that, a dollar per hundred or whatever? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah which I is mean, still still reasonable considering. Uh, but, that's um, a dollar per thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess yeah. I would say this. I, I love talking politics and Trump and all that, and uh, I think the thing that Trump understood, which – if you're out there and you hate Trump or you love Trump, it doesn't matter. It's to see success in a digital marketing forum that, I mean, obviously you can put a thumb on it and say, okay, Twitter was a big part of why he won. It's because he understands authenticity. He is who he is. Now, maybe he lies about who he is, but he, he has a narrative that he sticks to uh, most of the time. And then he understands immediacy. So if Hillary Clinton sent out a tweet, it probably went through two days of focus groups and 30 different people looking at it and changing it and altering it, whereas Trump's you know, came off his toilet or whatever, you know, it comes straight from his fingers. Um, and I think that there's one thing that social media has created for us is uh, a value on authenticity and in the momentness, if that's a term. Um, and I think he really captured that. So I think we can apply those things where we, you know, like him or don't, I, I didn't vote for the guy, but uh, we can take, we can understand things about how we should market from that. And that's why I like Twitter. It's there is there is no there's it's interconnected. You can speak to anybody that you want, um, and it's almost like uh, cathartic because it's like having a diary or a journal sort of, and it just happens that other people read it. And I don't have as many followers as you, so maybe someday. So you're using on your Twitter, you're using at Memphis Braces as a B to C play to try to get patients to your orthodontic office, and then you're yeah. using Neon Canvas as a B to B play to try to get. Um, who, who, who who's your target market on Neon Canvas? Is that dentists or orthodontists or both? Uh, sort of both. I mean, when we started Neon Canvas, we only started a year ago, and uh, you know, it's one of those things where I've already got two practices. I've got a family, you know, three kids, and too much going on. Um, but I have always loved digital marketing websites. When I was 15, I was building websites like, you know, like Metallica fan club websites and, and you know, they weren't very good. They weren't very Metallica, good. But in, it should have been Elvis yeah. Presley. You're in Memphis, dude. Uh, well, at the time I was in Jonesboro, Arkansas and, you know, Northeast Arkansas, it's all about the metal and classic, classic rock. So God, I uh, love, I love, there's only yeah. three streets of music in America. There's Bourbon street. There's in uh, New Orleans, there's Bill street yeah. in Memphis. And then there's second Avenue in uh, Nashville, and I don't care. A lot of people say, well, I'm not a big country music fan. Dude, you haven't been to Second yeah, Avenue. It doesn't matter if you're country. It's, that, that's yeah. the three best streets of music and I've in, anywhere I've ever been. Yeah, I agree. I agree. World. Yeah. There might be some places in Europe that compete on, on kind of an interest level, like uh, street performers, but there's nothing. I mean, Bourbon Street, nothing can beat the craziness of that. But I love Bill Street. I love walking, hearing the blues music. And then Broadway is, is pretty hard to beat. That thing has just gotten crazy. 
Uh, so when we go down there for meetings, it's it's insane. Broadway, I mean, all the you bands. Mean Manhattan? No, Broadway uh, in Nashville. Uh, oh. Broadway Second and all those that, that street where oh, there's Nashville. all those. Oh, Nashville. Oh, I, I was doing yeah. it was Second Street. I, I probably. Well, Broadway yeah. runs and then it runs into Second, and it's all there. And you've got these. Oh my I mean, God. I'm a, I'm a musician. I'm a drummer, and the the level of the musicianship in Nashville right now is absurd. I, I would say it's it's the music capital at this point. I mean, L. A. Still and New York, yeah, but. The level of musicianship there is uh, unreal, and, and they're the playing. Most, and the most Mary common, Jane Blast Band. and the most common remark you'll hear from the dentist when you're down there lecturing, and the, they're from out of, from around the country, they'll say, uh, "God, I, I always said I didn't like country music, and and this yeah. is so it's like it's it's a totally different experience when it's live on Second Street." Sure. Yeah. Is it Second so, Street or Second Avenue? Uh, it's actually they call it Broadway. It's kind of what it's. Huh. I guess colloquially referred to. I must have to. really They're... been drinking way too much. I, I remember it in Second Street. <laughs> well, well, Broadway runs this way, and then you got Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth, and then you had you know Bridgestone okay. Arena. And there's there's a lot of fun stuff down there. Um, but you were asking, we got off on that uh, about Neon, Neon Canvas. Is it for dentists yeah, or orthodontists? Yeah. So we focus. It's only been around for a year, and we've we've been really successful. We have some kind of legacy Memphis clients, and so we've got like the biggest real estate agent in Memphis, and. Uh, some restaurants and you know some other clients like that, and then we've got mostly orthodontists. We have a couple dentists, and it's not like it's closed to dentistry. It's just as an orthodontist, that was sort of the unique portion of the business is we had an orthodontist doing websites. And so, uh, oh, I remember what got us on this Metallica and <laughs> building websites. I was editor of yearbook and newspaper. I, I've always loved kind of creating and communicating and uh, publishing things like that, and so it just seemed natural. So worked with a guy that I he built uh, helped build my website and do the SEO. At another company, and so then we decided to start that. And so, no, we're we're open to anybody. I mean, I think we're doing really great stuff. Uh, I don't know what the dental world is like as much as the ortho world, but uh, mostly it was two major companies, and the websites are pretty cookie cutter. So we wanted to have things that were, you know, really custom and uh, true to orthodontics. You'll read some stuff on an orthodontic website, and it's like, who wrote this? Because this is not written by an orthodontist. And so that was sort of our goal: to speak uh, as an orthodontist would, in a way that patients would accept and would react to. So are you building these on a WordPress? Yeah. Yeah. You got a few options. I mean, you can have a proprietary uh, you know, software, but WordPress is universal. It's it's kind of what's here and what's to stay. There's issues. I think there's like security issues that are longstanding, but if you're doing it the right way, it's fine. And the nice thing is if you have a company build your website in WordPress and you end up falling out with them, you take it anywhere else and they'll be able to sustain it for you. Yeah, and, and you got to wonder, how can you have really good – SEO if you're with a cookie cutter website and there's 500 dentists like 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 Twitter's interesting like you, you go to Twitter and some mornings you'll wake up and like 12 different dentists just sent out the exact same tweet yeah you know I mean and it's you're like terrible. so so then so then you know that dentist didn't send that tweet he he didn't create that and and so how how could that be good SEO when uh, you got a cookie cutter website and there were 47 identical Facebook posts that morning and Twitter feeds and all that. I think an original content on a website. So, so when I grew up, the, when, I, when I got out of school, the hot new thing was the yellow pages. And all of us right. guys that did it uh, were frowned upon because that was just going to ruin the image of dentistry. Now the big thing is SEO. What do you think my homies need to think about when they're um, um, doing a website? And, and how much, oh, and how much yeah. do you charge to... Uh, so so, tell us, Dennis and Sensor, what does sure. what, Neon Canvas charge? If I'm if I'm sitting here driving to work and I'm 25 working at Heartland and I I want to start my own de novo practice, I want to get a website. What what should she know? What 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 can you do for? Her? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, if you're going to get a custom website where the content is loaded, where we come to your office, we do vid video and photo. I mean, we really make it a, a great website. Let's say. The website's going to be twenty five grand, and I know that number sounds huge because I think most people think like five, six, seven thousand for a website. But the market that we're in, it's there's so much money left on the table when you don't go for the best. And so if you go for a cookie cutter website that has basically underneath the hood, I kind of refer to it like a car. Like underneath the hood, you have the exact same engine as everyone else in your market, or you can go for the muscle car that's got six hundred horsepower. Like who's going to win that race ultimately? Um, and then a part of it is what the car looks like. And so it needs to look good. It needs to be, you know, aesthetically pleasing to your target demo and that sort of thing and tell your story too. Um, but we usually shoot for a retainer. So it's, it's one thing to build a website and to build it well. And if you do that, depending on your market, you could be successful. And if you're a little bit tech savvy and you're okay getting on there and doing your own blogs and editing your own stuff and giving Google what it, what it wants, which is unique, fresh content. And the best way to do that is in the form of a blog. 
you would understand that. You've got content coming out of your ears, man, um, which is a good thing. And it, it, it builds you. I mean, when you search on the internet, it, it brings your website up. Um, it, the best way to do that is, is regularly blogging. And most dentists can't do that. They're really good at doing dentistry, but they're not really good at digital marketing. Um, and so we usually seek a retainer somewhere in the range of two to 4000 a month. And in the first year, that package is in the website and things like that. So we are definitely not cheap. So it's um, twenty five grand for the website, and then two to four thousand a month. Well, it, so it depends. And so if if you're just getting the website, twenty five grand, you get a discount if you're on. You know, you kind of commit to a year long contract uh, with a certain monthly retainer. And we'll usually build it into that, and then in the year that follows, and the retainer goes down, as the website's not having to be rebuilt. And I guess what I would say is we, what we have found is we sort of entered the market with one sort of idea of what we'd offer, and now we've kind of diversified that because not every practice is the same. Um, it seems like we fit best in a practice where we can be about 3% of, of kind of their expenses. And so like we can kind of fit in there in, in, so in a comfortable the, spot. So just, so just of the website, it'd be 3% of revenue would be on marketing just for the website. Does that include SEO or Google ads or any of that, or just the, the engine? Just so the, the Google... So paying for the Google ads, Facebook ads are going to be an uh, extra. And, and I guess what I would say is that like I'm not the guy doing the proposals. So I mean I know what we're offering, but the proposals it always comes down to you know kind of what's going to fit and what they're after. And so we have kind of a typical package of what we know will build practices and what's been proven in my practice. Uh, but everyone's a little bit different. So if you're talking about really like a 25 year old dentist that's just getting out, we're probably beyond that. It's probably more for the practice that's produ producing two, two and a half you know, million, uh, not necessarily someone that's starting right off the bat. And in that situation, uh, it's kind of hard to say the approach I would take there is, is that you're small. It's sort of like guerrilla warfare. Like you can do social media yourself. You understand your story and you can tell it. You could blog. You got all the time in the world to blog, but once doctors get really successful and they're still trying to grow the practice, they don't have time to sit and make a blog and, and optimize things for search engines and things like that. I mean, most of them don't. Um, and so that's why a company like ours is important. Because uh, we know what it takes. I mean, the thing is, the rules are all known, basically, in terms of how to get a website up. And it's it's essentially create good content in the form of a blog, share it to social media, and get people to click through to your website to establish authority for your website. And then if you can start ranking nationally, so we rank nationally my orthodontic website on things like white spot lesions and you know uh, what not to eat with braces, stuff like that. So someone in China reads my blog on my website and sits there for four minutes and it raises the tide of my website so that when someone in Memphis searches for braces, they're more apt to find me and so I'm going to rank higher. And that's the game. And it's, you know, the rules are known. It's just who wants to spend the time to do it and write good stuff, share it to social media and have followers that want to click through and read the stuff. And it takes several years to sort of develop that. There's no shortcut. So like you're talking about a company sharing, you know, canned social media content on someone's Twitter. Nobody wants to read that. No one cares. And they'll unfollow you if you keep doing it, you know. So is this all? Is this your company? Or are you the sole owner? So I co-own it, co-founded it, co-own it with a guy named Alex Rasmussen. Uh, so he's the CEO, and like I said, he he's probably ten plus years of digital marketing experience. Used to build websites, and I would say he's Rasmussen? our SEO expert. R a s p e n s e n. No, Ra Rasmussen. Uh, R a s m u s s e n. Fagala and Rasmussen. Strong. R a s. Very strong. M A U S S E N. No, no R A S M U S S E N. Huh. Alex. Well, the, you know, the, the, the thing is, um, okay, so let's look at the $25,000 cost. Okay, the average, what would you say the average new patient's worth in orthodontist? Um, 6500 uh, Well, I mean, that's what you're charging them. Uh, I'd say average fee probably nationwide is yeah, 5600 okay, probably. So so, and then fifty yeah. six hundred for ortho records, the whole the whole new patients average. You're saying fifty six hundred. Yep. And depending on whatever market you're in, twenty five thousand divided by um, fifty six hundred uh, would only be uh, four and a half cases. And the general dentist, no matter what market you're in, is average. His new patient is worth the same as an orthodontist, but instead the orthodontist will capture it in twenty four months, where the dentist will capture it in sixty months. But the real metric is. And that dentists don't know, like they'll, they'll say they have a website and I'll say, well, how is it? Oh, it's great. And I'll say, well, how many people go to your website? How many of those convert to calling? They have no idea. So it's like, so, yeah. okay. So, so, I mean, Elvis Presley knows more about your website 
than you do, and, and, and he's been missing for uh, 30 years. By the way, did you know I saw Elvis Presley with my dad and mom at Henry did Love really? Arena in Wichita, Kansas? Oh, um, man, I'm jealous. I, that, was a, uh, that was a great deal. He was so bloated and loopy, <laughs> and he didn't finish any song without taking a break and taking a drink of water oh, and patting the sweat off his head. But anyway, so, so I mean, I mean, so <laughs> someone else might say, well, I got a website for 5,000. Well, they can't sure. tell you if 1,000 people went to their website to convert one to call or if it was 100 people for one to call. And then you say, well, when people call your office, um, you know, the national data is that between about three and a half, we'll go with say three people have to call before your receptionist can convert one to put a butt in a chair. Right. And, then, and then you sit there and then you have to, uh, then, then you look at a hundred million cavities diagnosed in America. They only drill, fill and bill 38%. So you need, so you need a thousand people to see your website before a person calls. You need three people to call before your receptionist who has no training converts one in the chair. And we need three people in the chair with a cavity before you can convert one to drill, fill and bill. So if you can just, and so what's the answer to this? Well, you know, I think I'm going to change my bracket. I think I've been using the Ormco <laughs> bracket, and I'm going to go to the Henry Schein Symposium, and I'm thinking about switching to a new whatever. Why don't we work on, so, so my question is, do you um, capture these metrics of conversion rates on your website? Have you ever gone, do you go to the existing website and say, okay, we just monitored your website for the last 30 days, and your conversion rate is, uh, one out of a hundred. Is it one out of ten? Is it one out of a hundred? Is it one out of a thousand? I mean, that I need a scorecard at the end of the Super Bowl. That's what I love about the Super Bowl. I don't care what you think at home on the audience. I don't care if they're doing the wave. The referees have decided that <laughs> that is a touchdown, and there are now six points on the board, and that is the final score. These dentists sure. never know their website scoreboard. Do you, do you capture any conversion data on that? Yeah, so one thing, and it's actually funny you bring this up, we are working towards kind of revamping our report system and our analytics to be able to just say that, to say, to study in certain offices, how many leads are we creating, how many are actually coming through, how many are actually starting treatment, so we can actually put a estimated ROI on that. Uh, for me, having done this for four years and having really always, my number one referral source has been digital marketing in some form. Uh, I have a good sense of how many we're getting a month. I mean, you got form fills on your website. We have tracking numbers so we can see when people call from the website. Uh, you've got, you can see which one of those came from Google ads, which one of those came from organic. And so we have an analytics suite that ties all that in together and you can see all that stuff in one little website. And so it's something that we use for clients. Um, what I've kind of found is you have clients that are really analytical and you have those that are not and that are more kind of momentum based or like, well, I know it's working. I know it's there. And I honestly fall into that category uh, probably more than I should. But I mean, we you know, again, a good month on our website, we'll get 60 form fills. Uh, we also have chats and we're getting typically in the range of 20 to 25 leads from our little chat applet that hangs out in the lower right hand corner. And so you're talking conservatively in an orthodontic office, you know, 75, 80 just from form fills and chats. I mean, that's a lot of potential clients. Okay, you're um, using, you're using yeah. a lingo that a lot of my homies, I mean, 20% yeah. of these guys are still in dental school. So you, you said form fills, right? Yeah, so you so, go so on a, you is go on a website. Is that a request an appointment? Yeah, so request appointment. For us, it's schedule a free consultation. That's kind of the orthodontic thing. I so guess which, dental so office. What is, so you're calling it form fills. Is that Tennessee slang? Is it more likely to be called <laughs> a... Um, uh, request would you would you call it a request an appointment or a form fill or what would you what's the technical I did I just call it a form I think that's like you know Silicon Valley speak maybe like nerd speak uh, just you've got a form so an information form and they fill it and then it 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 ideally it alerts your uh, receptionist or one of your receptionists and they call on that same day to schedule them to bring them in and so you've got all different types of patients you, yeah what is your average convert? If someone takes the time to fill out a form, what's the chance that your receptionist can get them to walk physically into your office? So I would say, and I don't have the exact data, and I, I need to get it together, honestly. Um, but I would say, from what I gather, it's probably in the range of someone that goes online and passively decides, sometimes at two in the morning, to either chat us or to fill out a form, request an appointment. It's probably in the range of about eighty-five percent that schedule, which is pretty strong. And from so those, how, how does that yeah. chat applet work when your office is closed and it's 2 o'clock in the morning? 
So I use a, it's a group that's focused on orthodontists. There's two main ones in the orthodontic space. The one I use is Ortho Chats. It's actually run by a guy out of Kansas City, a really great family. Mother is an orthodontist. He works in the office. And they have a team that kind of works in the same central space, so they don't outsource it. The thing I like is they understand kind of how your office speaks. They've got information, so they speak almost as close as you can get to someone that was actually in your office. And they cover it 21 hours a day. So I think they don't cover... 21 hours? Yeah, I think they're not covering from like two to five in the morning, which is going to be the lowest, you know, traffic. I bet uh, you know and what I that, bet that's related to. I bet you anything. What's that? I bet you anything. He's Irish, and that's when they don't allow them to sell alcohol in Kansas. City. They probably <laughs> probably can't buy a beer after two, and then they start again at yeah. five in the morning. So he yeah. just says, "No, nope. can't buy a can't beer." Can't stay up without Jameson. I'm just going to go yeah. home and go to bed. So, <laughs> so he covers it two to five ortho chat, and. Um, or it's actually uh, ortho chats. Yeah, ortho chats. And I mean, there's a ser- I'm sure there's a dental service. You can even do it yourself with something called Olark. It's just a chat applet. It's just a, a few lines of JavaScript. You ju- you drop it on your website, and it you, you've been on a website where it pops up. You go on FedEx.com, and it pops up. Um, it's the fact that it's a real person, and it's not like an automated thing, because those will piss people off. Um, but it's just another way by which you capture leads. So and you try and take Olark- cold leads. The other one was yep. Olark, and that's one where the dentists would put in their own messages. You say, well, that you could you could uh, you could be the one on the end. So your receptionist ostensibly could be sitting there and have the little chat applet open, and then someone chats and they respond. Uh, a couple guys that I knew that tried that, they found that the response time was a lot slower than when they outsourced it. And also, there's a lot of people that chat in from six to midnight. You know, in the hours you wouldn't be in there. And so I think uh, you know if I spend let's say six hundred dollars a month on ortho chats, you know, on a chat service where they're going to be monitoring at 21 hours a day and on the weekends. Uh, for me, again, as you broke down kind of what orthodontics is worth, if the patient's 5,600 and you got an average overhead of 50%, so it, at worst you're saying a patient is worth $2,500 to you, paid out over two years, it's worth it. If I get one patient, then I've paid for the, the fee, you know, I've paid the 600 bucks. Um, and I would argue it's, it's a competitive advantage. And so if in your market you have chat and no one else does, who's going to win that battle? You know, so if someone said to you prioritize, let, let's do an upside down pyramid. So the upside yeah. down be the most deal. So when you're building a website, go to go. Let's go most important. We'll do the top 10, 10, uh, okay. 10 being uh, what do you want to will 10 be the most important or the least important? Well, we'll go number one to 10. So yeah, start at one, one. Yeah. One, one, one to 10. What would be the most important? And then 10 will be the least important because I'm wondering my my walnut brain's thinking um, request appointment how high a chat applet I mean is that like the most important least important um, we're also seeing uh, now dental companies are um, po- are making it so you can schedule uh, your appointment yourself online in the middle of the night uh, we we um, yep. um, open dental is now uh, doing that feature and we had a podcast guy on here let me uh. A uh, podcast from a, a close to you, Louisville. Uh, get yeah. him on the schedule with Keith English, and uh, Keith English. What's the name of his company, Ryan? Um, founded Oh Local Med, and okay. he he he's. I think he's got Local Med on fourteen hundred websites, and the lowest one is scheduling two patients a month, and he has several that are doing. He actually said he has hundreds that are doing a hundred to three hundred. Uh, people a month are scheduling appointments because there's 160 wow. hours in a week and most dental offices only open 32 hours. So if they go to your website and it's two o'clock sure. in the morning, they just, they just schedule. So, so let's, let's go one to 10. What do you think is the most sure. important should be on that? Um, so I, I actually have, have created for a lecture that I give uh, the top five. Okay. So I'll do those and then we can talk about some other ones. Uh, and so I think this helps make sense. And I actually Good gathered this from across the internet. Yeah. You counter with five. Well, Good I'll give you mate. five. <laughs> Let's meet in the middle at seven and a half. We'll add okay, some we'll more at the end. Um, yeah. So number one, just, number one, most or, or you could just pretend you're a politician, just start making shit up. And I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'll just start talking about something else. Uh, so <laughs> some of you all agree in, um, but the number one, most important thing in terms of search engine optimization, which I think that's the goal. And so, the goal is not to have the most beautiful website or to have, you know, your CV be a thousand items long or whatever. The goal is, is to get butts in your seats. You know, so, I mean, it's to, it's to produce. And so uh, SEO is going to be the way. So search engine optimization, you need to be optimized for as many different search terms as you can. So the number one thing is a responsive and user-friendly website. 
Um, and so responsive simply means that it works on all devices. Uh, we have now entered the mobile first uh, era of the internet. And so we as doctors, we as people who've grown up in a desktop first mindset, that's the mindset we have. And it, it's it's wrong. So we we design websites with the mobile in, in mind. You got to make the desktop look good. And there's less space with mobile. It almost feel like telling like Da Vinci to, to paint on a canvas that was a lot smaller. It, it's not fun. You can't make it as fun. Uh, and yet that's the world we're in. So it's, it's got to be responsive. It's got to work on everything. It's got to be user friendly. So it's got to be easy to find things. It needs as a dentist, we want to complicate things. Typically, it needs to be simple. And so I like to talk about an avatar client. And so if my avatar client is an orthodontist, is a 28 to 45 year old mom of two and a half kids. And you imagine her kind of driving her kids to soccer in a minivan. That's who I want to make the website for. And so what would she respond to? She's going to respond to, and I don't mean to stereotype, but that's the reality in the orthodontic world. Um, but she's going to respond to softer things, to so less tech, uh, maybe like kind of like what an Apple web, website looks like or Lululemon or something like that. So, um, you know, we, we respond to lasers and technology and stuff like that. But So number one was SEO and responsive user-friendly website because yeah. now Google's gone to mobile first because now – uh, when I was little, it was the IBM mainframe. Then Microsoft <laughs> came out with the with the microcomputer software, Microsoft, which we call the PC. And now over 50% of the internet traffic is actually on a smartphone. So Google's going to serve up websites that look better on your iPhone and your Samsung than on a desktop. So that was number one, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So number two would be unique, engaging, and fresh content, which is kind of a fancy way of saying you need to blog. Uh, I guess you could do it in the way of updating pages or adding pages or adding content to pages, but really the best way to do that is to blog. And I would say to anyone that's out there, so this is a dental student, and you're thinking, well, what am I going to blog about? Uh, ask patients, you know, survey patients, what is the you know number one question you have about dentistry? Collect those. You'll have a list of 20. Sit in your car. You can record it on your little, you know, if you got an iPhone, you got the little audio recorder. Record yourself talking about that topic for 10 minutes. Take that audio, drop it in online. There's there's sites that will transcribe that for you for really cheap, or just use Siri if you're you know cheapskate or whatever. You just want to do it that way, and then you've got basically a blog. So then you go in, you edit. I mean, it's not the easiest thing to ever do. Uh, and so if you've got a background in yearbook and newspaper, and maybe you've done a blog or you've written for something, it's easier. But content creation, people always ask, and I'm sure they ask you all the time. And I'd like to ask you is like, how do you come up with all this stuff? It's you know it's really not that hard once you start doing it. It's just like anything else. It's how do you cut, you know, 30 crowns in a day? Well, I, I had to do 15 and then I did 20 and then I did not do 30. You know, so I mean, it's you just got to make yourself uh, keep yourself on a schedule. And so a publishing calendar is a good way to do that. Just like, you know, L magazine would have a publishing calendar. Create one for yourself and just make yourself blog a couple times a month. But what you just said that is most profound is dentists and um, patients are usually um, Mars and Venus. Um, you should blog about what a patient asked what yeah when, when the patient asks a question and you just found yourself with this spirited rant for five minutes that's the perfect blog and it's tested because you didn't pull this out of your butt you were yeah. actually asked this by a live customer in your demographic deal just like my my column i have i've written a column every month since 1994 and i refuse yeah. to schedule a time to um do a <laughs> column because i just can't sit there and all of a sudden feel passionate rant what I do is some dentist will send me an email, and if I feel something like, oh, my God, you should blah, 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 blah. I, yep. I type it out and hit reply and CC my editor, and it's like, mm -hmm. that was an awesome, passionate rant. I, I don't want to do a column on this so when the cut, So get a disciplined way on, your, on a notepad or something, so when it actually happens, um, you actually – capture the question and that that's your blog how long should yep. that blog be what, what what do you think the word count should be we usually shoot for a thousand characters plus or minus which is really not that much a thousand I mean, that's, characters how long how long would I mean, no, 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 not a thousand characters sorry a thousand words a thousand words not a thousand characters a thousand okay. characters would be really easy that's like six sentences uh, a thousand thousand words and and, and and two monkeys talking how long of a conversation is a thousand words I mean, I this past weekend, I've had a lot of articles lately. Two thousand word article, I probably spoke it in, you know, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. I mean, and, and actually speaking, if you could start and then stop, I mean, it might even be two thousand words. I bet that's like fifteen minutes, ten minutes. It's not that long. 
Okay. I think the average human speaks 300 words. Wait, is, is it we read 300 words a minute? I think we speak 300 words a minute. Something like that. I don't know. But it would not take long is a short version of it. I think what kills people when they're trying to create content is both not making themselves do it. And so they don't put themselves out there. They don't put themselves in the game. And then also uh, what kills them is staring at a blinking cursor on a Word document. I think like with the technology we have now, there's no reason why you should not speak it. And then at least allow that to be your first draft. Um, and there's so many services you can use, you know, you can find somebody to help re refine your, if you stink at grammar and English and whatever else, like, but you're good talking, uh, have somebody do that for you. You can go to, I the, just learned yesterday yeah. the difference between T H E I R and T H E R E. I had no idea. Yeah. See, my mom's an English teacher, so I've got that oh down, my God. <laughs> but it, but it paralyzes you when you're like a, you know, intense grammarian, it kills you. So. And it's sometimes nicer to just be a quick start and just kind of just go for it, you know? Yeah. So then what's number three? Number three is keyword optimization. So that would be like kind of what you think of like historically as, as SEO or search engine optimization. And back in the day, Google was not smart and its algorithm was not smart. And so you could just, you know, stuff into the, the hidden part of the page. This page is about dentistry and crowns and implants and all these sort of things. And so when you would search and then it would ping with those things, well, that's a long gone Thing And yet still the words that are on your website need to talk about the things you're hoping to sell. And so when you're blogging, you know, some of our most successful blogs have been like, we'll do a, a shopping guide at Christmas for Memphians. Like that is going to do really well on social media because everybody wants to know about that it has zero to do with orthodontics. But you better believe that I find a way to talk about the fact that we're an orthodontic office that provides braces and Invisalign and so on and so forth. And underneath the surface, what's called like alt text, like under photos, it's going to have some of those things buried in there, but the, the blogs are really going to help build your business in the way of when people search for braces or orthodontics or orthodontist or Invisalign is going to be talking about those same topics and optimizing those keywords when you talk about them. And so, you know, every blog that we try and put out for a client is going to talk about the geography that they're in, you know, the three to eight, you know, major cities that they're surrounding them. Uh, it's going to talk about their name and it's going to talk about the services they provide. Um, so you're just optimizing for those keywords and that shows up on your website 50 times and Google reads those websites and one website has it once and one has it 50 times. Who are they going to rank higher? You know, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of thinking about the, the name. I mean, I, I, I what, what do you think the name of your website like you are um, you are Saddle Creek Ortho, which I think is amazing because for SOE, I assume Saddle Creek is a suburb of Memphis. It's a city. Yeah, it's it's really honestly, there's a shops of Saddle Creek. There is no such thing as. Saddle Creek. There's no creek named Saddle, um, but we just thought it was a nice name. It helped the you know people in the area knew where we would be. It's also kind of an upscale shopping center, so it kind of we sort of like you know kind of you want to hang out with people that are well known, have good <laughs> reputations, and so we kind of did it with our name. We also could not be Fagala Orthodontics for reasons we've already discussed, so uh, we like the name. And now we've put a second location in an area that is not Saddle Creek, and it's okay because our name is kind of beyond that. It's kind of grown beyond that. Um, well, this I is think very that, this is very politically incorrect, but this is dentistry uncensored. But I see so okay. many people that use their last name, and I mean yeah. they're Persian, they're Farsi, they're from India, they're from Vietnam, Thailand. It's like, dude, um, I, I I think one rule is if I if you say the name, I should be able to spell it. When you say Saddle Creek, I'm thinking S A D D L E, yeah. Creek C R E Creek. But when you say Rosh, like like, like your partner's name. Uh, when you said uh, um, Alex Rasmussen, I you I had to spell it three times R A S M U S S E N, but I I wrote it down and you said no, so we had to go over the spelling three times. And yeah. these guys are going with that as their name because they got it from their mama and their daddy, and they love their mama and their daddy. But God sure. dang, it's not very good so, at marketing. Here's a good way of putting that. Uh, if you asked a hundred patients in my practice where they go, they'd all know Saddle Creek Orthodontics. If you asked 100 of them who I was or what my name was, I would like to think they would know my name, but there's a good chance they wouldn't. Or they would call Fagala some you know, variation. There's probably 18 different variations. And actually, it's funny. You look at the search data for Dr. Fagala, and there's like 15 different spellings you know, because they don't know how to spell it. So I think this idea that it has to be named after you, like, so it's got to be Dr. Jones, cosmetic dentistry, and family dentistry, or whatever, like the old kind of paradigm, uh, it needs to shift. And so you need to create a unique and creative brand. And you can't do that around a name, especially if it's Jones. Or in this sense, you don't want to name it something where people can't spell it and can't find it. And so, you know, there's a, you talk 
the book positioning, kind of classic marketing book. And you need to be able to position in the mind of the consumer something that's unique and associated well in their minds. And so if you're the 19th Memphis you know, cosmetic dentist, they're not going to be able to find you. And so you need to position uniquely. Kind of like you're talking about with Xerox. Hard word to spell, but it's, it's positioned uniquely. Um, so, why so, did, so why did you go with Saddle Creek? Why didn't you go LBGT Creek by Dr. Tagula? <laughs> <laughs> it was taken. That, it was, yeah. I was taken. So, was so, so you agree with the name thing? Like, <laughs> like I had a really good friend, and he was um, from Iran. His name was Sina Saraya. I said, "Dude, go with Sounds Steve. Like go, yeah, go just go with Doctor Steve. You don't spend thirty years teaching yeah. everyone how to spell Sina Saraya." Yeah, I don't care. I, I'm Doctor Kyle, and I, I think they know who I am. But really, at the end of the day, I want them to know Saddle Creek Orthodontics because when they're going to tell a friend, like you know, maybe if they say, you know, Doctor Kyle, he's awesome. That's great, but. I want them to understand the culture of Saddle Creek Orthodontics. Uh, it's just a more marketable thing. So, hey, hang on a second. My my dental You're assistant. Fine. My dental assistant's not very excited that I'm over here podcasting. That's my dental assistant of thirty years. It's like having a wife when your dental assistant worked for you for thirty years. Hey, doc. Hey, Jed. So what's going on? The only the only per, the person who loves my show the most is seriously only me. Um, <laughs> Everybody else is only uh, uh, listening to it because they'd rather listen to uh, us than uh, talk radio. Yeah, there you go. Well, I, 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 think, I think the political scene has uh, done the, the biggest boom for podcasts because these dentists yeah. say, I can't listen about Trump and Russia and Hillary and Putin an hour or two and from work each day. I'm going insane. I'd rather listen to, you know, um, you know, horses burp than. Uh... So, so that's why <laughs> all podcasts are exploding. And the price of radio stations. Go call a radio station broker. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are radio stations they can't give away yep. uh, because of podcasting, um, yeah. which is user generated content as opposed to the other. OK, so um, so no, we were on number. So number three was keyword yeah. optimization. And then number yeah. four and five, what were four and five? Four and five. Four is quality backlinks. Five is page load speed. So quality backlinks would just mean that if, and you would understand this again, is that if somebody that has authority, like let's say Forbes.com or Washington Post or something decides to post an article of yours and then link back to your website, it tells Google, oh, you've got friends in high places. And so it, it, it helps rank your website up. Those are the harder things to do. So you need you know some PR arm if you're going to go for these sort of things. But the more that you write, the more that you lecture, the more that you publish, the more opportunities you're going to get to do that sort of thing. Uh, the last one's page load speed. And that simply means that we are our attention span continues to shrink and shrink and shrink. I think our attention span is, is less than that of like a cricket now or something. Um, I just made that up. But uh, it needs to load quick. So if, and then another thing is like little things like uh, if you open up your phone and you're in bad Internet area, uh, it, it loads kind of halfway. It'll show you what's called a skeleton screen. And so there's little ways to trick people into staying around. Um, and so if it loads really slow because you got some big photo or thing that has to load first, uh, you're kind of dead in the water because people are going to give up and they're going to bounce elsewhere, which tells Google there's something wrong with your website. Yeah, and, and everybody listening to this should know, just you know, think of your own behavior. If you're on Facebook or Twitter and you see a link and you hit it, I mean, how long are you going to wait for that damn thing to load? Not very long, yeah. I mean, what, I mean, what, I, do, you, what do you think the wait? What, what do you think the average wait before they click off is? It, it depends, but it, it's obviously uh, directly proportionate to age, So, or maybe that's inversely proportionate, but I think the younger we are and the, the more we've grown up with Internet and it's slow, I'm out. I mean, even YouTube, like a five-second ad, I'm like, nah, I'm not waiting. <laughs> like it's... You know, like I'm impatient when it comes to the internet, and so if your website still loads, like, oh, I'll go somewhere else. You know, and, and that's, that's why they've got. A, you know. Okay, so I want to tell you what um, my um, favorites are on a website, but maybe yeah, I, I don't have data on this because I'm not in that space. Uh, yeah, there's but, a lot uh, more that could be said, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't like to see a picture of a dentist. I, I, I love it. I just love it. Like even on your website, you know, you have YouTube videos. And yeah. I, I, you know, when you see a website that says Dr. Faye Rand and there's a, there's a mug shot, as opposed to a video and saying, hey, thanks for coming to our website. I've been at all, with, you know, I, I, I want to see the human. Right. And so many of those dentists, even though, like, I look at a lot of the local websites, like friends I know. Yeah. It's like, dude, that, that's like the worst picture of you. And it doesn't capture your insane dry humor. You're funnier than shit. Why don't yep. you put a one minute? How long should that YouTube video be up? Uh, how long should the video itself be, or how long should it yeah, be on, on there? the website? Like, like how how long? I I think yeah. I think if I was going to uh, say I needed uh, a doctor for something, I, I'd rather meet the doctor in video. I mean, I mean, yep. I, I think it's obvious that we've gone from text, print, 
to video. I yep. mean, I mean, so yeah. Do so, you, if, do you think that website should have a YouTube video of uh, anybody who's got their hands in, in your mouth? Uh, well, I mean, here's here's what I would say. There's a lot of things that were thrown out there. It, if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video is worth like a million. So yeah, video is king. It's it's the next level. And if you can do that on social media, you can be super successful. And we're redesigning our website. So the website that's up is four years old. And so the new one will probably come out in a couple months. It's gonna be awesome. And we're gonna lead with video, kind of B-roll video in the background. That will be the first thing because it tells a way more diverse story than even you know a series of five photos possibly could. Um, and you've got to remember, like, what does someone that is interested in straightening their smile or in the dental realm, like they want implants or their teeth hurt or whatever, they want to see themselves uh, on the website. They don't want to see you. They don't really care what you look like. And they don't want you to be so professional that you seem boring. That's the whole going back to the Trump thing. It's, it's, it's authenticity is really big. And so they would rather you have uh, a quirky sense of humor. There's a guy out of uh, Washington named uh, Cole Johnson. He's an orthodontist. And he has the quirkiest sense of humor. And I guarantee you that for every 10 people that read his posts, one or two are offended, but the eight love him. And so that is the one thing is that we are so afraid to offend that one out of 100 that we don't appeal to anyone. You know, we just seem very cookie cutter and we have our white coat on and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, we just need to push beyond what our understanding of dentistry would be. So if you're really into music, like make your website about that. And I can guarantee there's other people will be attracted to that and to think that you're a real person. So video, you talked about YouTube. Yeah, you should have videos, uh, but you need to do them well. Um, and I think the, like probably the ideal length of like a, here's what our practice is about video is probably two and a half to three minutes at the most. Um, and sometimes you'll like load them and they're like 17 minutes long. And if somebody sees that, they're not watching that. You know, they're going to kind of flip through it. It's two and a half minutes people will watch it, and there's data behind all that. But, yeah, you need to keep it short, succinct, get to the point. The hope is they're going to watch it. And they may just watch the first 30 seconds, but they should be able to get what you're about and kind of what your culture is about. Yeah, and, they should watch um, um, that Howard Stern movie. What was that called? Uh, Golden or uh, Private Parts. Private Parts, yeah. And everybody um, – they do that at every dental convention in the world. Like there will be a complaint. And yep. so they'd fire him. He's like, screw you. He'd just get a buzz. And he just went around, went around for years, years, and years before finally some guy said, well, let's say half of New York City hates him. Great. The other half is 12 and a half million people. They love yeah. him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think it's authentic. I've spent my entire life uh, not giving a shit about <laughs> the survey. I mean, because I'm sitting there lecturing. And sure. 90% of the class is busting up, laughing, staying all yeah. day. Then at the end, you always know. The, the some dweeb idiot from the association going to go, Mrs. Johnston walked out because you said fart 14 <laughs> times. I'm like, well, does Mrs. Johnston not fart? I mean, if yeah. this was Hollywood, yeah. it's PG-13. There was no nudity. I, you know, I didn't drop the F-bomb. I mean, I mean brief it's just, nudity. Brief nudity. Brief nudity. And yeah, uh, yeah so I, I've never cared. And I, I thought it was a badge of honor that half the places I've ever lectured in 25 years said we will never have you back well I'm yeah like, that's, that's freaking awesome man that's, yeah, that's awesome now, now, now they're just gonna have to travel to see me because yeah. i was standing at the front of the room and they were laughing their ass off and well, then they you, focused on the one person that was uh didn't like a fart joke you should i love fart jokes so you can tell you weren't telling enough fart jokes in my mind um I think that there's a book called Raving Fans that like everyone's right. read probably, and it talks about department stores where 100 people come and shop and one person steals, and so then they put up the sign to punish the 99 that says only five items or less, and what they do effectively is they sell fewer items because they're limiting uh, the average consumer. You see in an Apple store, like the products are right there. Like you, There's no doubt that they lose products, that products get shoplifted all the time. And yet they sell more products because of the immediacy, uh, the immediacy, and the, and kind of the, the products right there. You can just pick it up and take it out. Uh, so they get that, and they factor that into their uh, profit loss statement. They know they're going to get shoplifted, but they're also going to sell more. Um, so that is, Dennis, as Dennis, we were very cautious. We went down a path in life where we were rewarded by careful and and long term thinking. We went to four years of college, went to four years of dental school. Some of us went to three years of specialty or whatever. Uh, but we have to be kind of throw caution to the wind a little bit when it comes to social media and our websites. Uh, we're always worst case scenario thinkers, and it's it gets in our way. So, what what do you, um, when you talk about um, why based storytelling is that for your website? Is that for your blog? Why based storytelling? Science yeah. and X. Start with why. Golden Circle. Why? How? What? Dell versus Apple. We all need to change yeah. our outlook on how we practice dentistry. 
is that in your blogs? Uh, I just think that's in general. I think that's in the way that we operate. And honestly, it's funny. Like this feeds right into this conversation about your website is, is that the short version is if you've not listened to, to Simon Sinek's uh, TED Talk, it's like 15 minutes and he talks about his book, uh, Start With Why. It's a great book. The TED Talk is probably even better, especially if it's a short attention span. But he talks about how Dell and Apple in the late 90s, Dell was about the what and how of computers. So they were about uh, you know a computer with the biggest hard drive, the fastest processor speed at the best price, whereas Apple was about the why, the belief system. They were about challenging the status quo, about thinking differently and everything then emanated out from that. And what happened was is that Dell, when they released an MP3 player, it did not sell because Dell is a computer company. When Apple released an MP3 player, it sold off the shelves because they're more than that. And they're almost sort of like a religion. And they understand their why, and people believe in it, and they ascribe to it. And so every little thing they come out with, people stand in line to get. And Dell is barely afloat um, because they're a computer company. And we as dentists, we go to work, I think, and we design our websites, I think, with the how and the what of dentistry uh, considered. And so what, what's the what? Well, as an orthodontist, uh, I straighten the teeth of adults and children. How do I do it? I use braces. I use Invisalign. Why do I do it is a more compelling marketing concept. So why I do it is, is to make my patients' lives better, to give them self-esteem, to make them smile more, to allow them to enjoy life more. And if I can build my marketing around a why-based concept of the storytelling, uh, rather than a how or a what based concept of storytelling, it's going to do better in the market. So I see so many posts on social media like, here's Johnny, he just got his braces off, doesn't he look great? And it's like, I guess, it's just so boring. Uh, it'd be a lot better to tell something about who Johnny is and lead with that instead of the how and the what. And the how and the what's important. If the Apple computer sucked, nobody would buy it. It wouldn't matter what they're about or what they believe or what their mission statement is, but it turns out their product is good and it matches their why. Um, and so if you've not read that, I mean, it, it'll change your entire outlook on how you do things. And the last thing I would say is, is that a hygienist, if she goes to work and she's only focused mentally on the what and how of what she does, well, I got to use this Cavitron to scrape this crud off his tooth. Uh, it's not going to be a fun way of living. If she instead goes with the why in her mind of, I'm going to make this patient's life better. I'm going to, whether, you know, if you're a religious person, I'm a mission to them, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try and be positive and help this person. I want this to be the best part of their day at the same time that I'm cleaning their teeth. I think it's a more powerful way of viewing life. And it's just a little twist. So the golden circle is the idea that the why is on the inside. You start at the core of something, and then you move outward. But as dentists, we typically start on the outside uh, on the what, and then we move. Maybe we never even make it to the why. Um, so a lot more that could be said, a lot more that Simon Sinek has uh, kind of innovated on, and I really recommend Start With Why as a book. Nice. I, I love that TED Talk. And uh... – are you, are you okay? I've gone way over with you. Are you are I'm you fine. Okay? I got nothing to do. Nothing okay. to do. Um, you also talk about helpful digital tools. You talk about Slack, G Suite, yeah. Blinklist, LastPass. What, what's all that? Yeah, so uh, I don't get paid by any of these companies, but I, I just feel like there's a lot of digital tools that, you know, we're all, you know, we all have Facebook, we all have Gmail, or, you know, the majority of us, let's say. But there's a lot of, like, really good digital tools that we just maybe just don't know about. Um, Slack is the perfect way to communicate with your team. And so both at Neon Canvas and at Saddle Creek Orthodontics, we have Slack. It's basically like an amalgam of chat and email and text messaging. Um, but the beauty of it when you're managing a team is I can have a channel for clinical, I can have a channel for reception or marketing, or I can private message one person, two people, and it's all archived too. And if you have to let someone go, they can be pushed out of the channel really easily. Um, and it's more professional than group texting or having a Facebook group and then someone doesn't want to be on Facebook and it's like, okay, forget it. We're, we're going to use Slack. Um, and the sign of a good product is, is that Microsoft has copied it. So Microsoft has, and they'll do it worse, but Microsoft has Microsoft Teams, which is the same idea. Um, G Suite is just, it used to be called Google Apps and it's just basically that your business should be uh, running its email and uh, sharing drive space through G Suite. So it's $5 per user. Go ahead. G, okay, G Suite's G's for Google. It's just Google. Yeah, it's just Google. It used to be called Google Apps, and it's basically a combination of all their free things. So like Google Drive, which is an amazing uh, product. It's like Dropbox, uh, but you can get uh, unlimited space if you're paying them, if you're a business owner. Um, also Google Docs. I don't know if you use Google Docs, but it's incredible. It's way better than Word and even Google Sheets. And so these are collaborative things that you can share, and they're always backed up in the cloud, and it's very cheap. Um, so if you're starting a business – G Suite's the way to go. You can actually get it HIPAA compliant. It's kind of beyond the scope of this, but uh, you can do HIPAA compliant through G Suite. 
Um, what's the other one? Blinkist. If you like to read, I love to read. Audible is great. I think audiobooks are a whole other way of thinking about reading where, you, you know, when you're in dental school, when you're in college and you have to read, you know, biology books, you don't want to read for leisure. Or most people don't, unfortunately. But Audible is great. 15 bucks a month. You can get a book. Books are somewhere between 12 and $19. Uh, you can listen it two times faster if you want to do that while you're working out, listen to a book. There's just so many ideas that are out there, and it's a shame to adopt this idea that once you graduate dental school that you're done learning. It's actually when learning should begin, and I know that would be one of your big – I'm just preaching the choir here. but um, And Blinkist summarizes books. So Blinkist is kind of like Cliff Notes but in an aud- uh, audible uh, format, and so you can listen to a book in 15 minutes. So it summarizes each chapter, and it speaks it to you, and it's like 60 bucks a year. So it's awesome. So if you want to try it. How do I get them to cover my uh, book on Amazon Dentistry or business, uh, contact uh, Uncomplicate Business? Yeah, you can request. What you should do is have your users as a, a request a book on Blinkist, uh, and you can have users request it for them to do it. Now, I don't know if they would or not, um, but they've got a pretty good library. I mean, it's going to be mostly. It's been selling really well on Amazon. It's been good. Uh, it's got like 55 star reviews. It's... You know, it's we, we have short attention spans, and there's no reason to not read. And an average audiobook takes seven, eight, nine hours, and you could be through, you know, 30 Blinkists in that amount of time. It's not going to be the same experience, but you can get some good ideas. And we've all read 200 page books where you get to the end and you're like, I could have read that in 15 minutes, you know? So Blinkists are good for that. That's why uh, I like uh, Dental Town Online CE because what people don't know is behind the scenes, these doctors will send a three-hour video, but you take out the family vacation, the jokes, the this, the that, the that, <laughs> and next thing you know, it's it's one hour and twelve minutes of content by yeah. just editing out all the ums, ahs, the 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 technical difficulty, the slide projector. Yeah, sure, it's, uh, sure, yeah, uh, yeah. Last one on there is LastPass. There's also one called Wor- One Password. I don't know if you use this or not, but it's just a password uh, vault, and so you only have to remember one password. And the place we've reached now is, is that your passwords, you'll go onto a website, and now they've changed the rules, and it's like, well, your password's not long enough, or it doesn't have this capital letter, or this number, or this figure. you got to change it. And so in my mind, I know like 18 passwords, and it's terrible. So uh, LastPass, it'll keep up with all your passwords, and you only have to remember that one password. So the idea is that's the last password you have to remember and that's huge. There, there's no excuse for not knowing your password because it's stored in that vault. Um, so I would start that now because when you start a business, your number of passwords and accounts is going to go through the roof. Yeah, mine is uh, – um, my, my password is always just password because whenever I ask for a password, yeah. I just type in password. That's how I, I remember you, my password. I don't know if you watch Silicon Valley. Do you watch that show? No. No. Well, there's a guy on there that's kind of adult. His name's Big Head, and his username was password. His password was password. So there you go. Password um, was password. No, his username was password, and his password was password. So, anyway, <laughs> not a well, smart hey, guy. Um, seriously, uh, I just want to tell you, man, that this was awesome, and uh, I think you're awesome, and uh, I think I think my homies had a great time listening to you. Good deal. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking to my homies. Sorry, I kept you 20 minutes uh, uh, longer than uh, you committed to, but uh, okay. You're awesome, it's fun. man. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. You ever want to come back and update us on more, what's changed, all that stuff? Let me know. I yeah, could li- always. I could listen to you for forty days and forty nights. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, anytime. I enjoy. I love speaking. Love talking. Uh, I could argue uh, politics for another hour if you want after this is uh, turned off. So we can do that. Well, you know Just the, the reason. Second. The reason I don't in that because it's um, <laughs> the the the, re- the reason I you know I'm always telling my my boys that you know if, if you follow that stuff three hours a day from age. 25 to 45 you'll, you'll have nothing to show for it yeah but if you but if you spend that three hours a day going back and getting your mba online or getting a part-time job or just any i mean it's just yeah. a come it's the most it's amazing how many people spend so much time keeping up on something that they have zero impact to change it'll never yeah. it'll never make them be able to afford a cup of coffee i mean it was just like mm-hmm. I mean, they, they might as well just have been standing out in the backyard watching paint dry on their house. I mean, it's yeah, totally, yeah, no, I, I, totally, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, there are things that I spend time on, like fantasy football. That I know a total waste of time, and we need some of those things. There's a really cool thing called the Eisenhower box. President Eisenhower came up with its idea that there's things that are urgent, not urgent, important, not important, and we spend most of our time, unfortunately, on things that are not important and they're not urgent. Watching Netflix. But here's the difference between fantasy football and Fox News. <laughs> when when you're doing fantasy football, you're having fun, and the yeah. people around you are having fun. Yeah. When you're on the political deal, 
your voice is elevated, you're stressed, you're, you're talking like a loud monkey, and the people around you are like, chill, dude. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I don't want to go to a bar and talk about something that's going to make everybody get mad and sure. animated yeah. and crazy. I love the NFL because it's a perfect mix of I'm really into it, but I know it's entertainment. I mean, obviously, whoever wins or loses the game, nothing happens to their city. It's not like some kid's going to miss a meal if they don't scare right. a It's just... <laughs> but you know it's entertainment. It's the same thing with charity. You know, when I do dentistry, you know, you need a filling. You give me two fifty, I do the filling. Um, if you don't pay, it's pay to play. And if you don't have the money, then I get to decide right then: am I up for charity? Like I always yeah. am for an extraction because I, I, I mean, I would rather pull your tooth. I'd rather pay you ten bucks. <laughs> I, I'd pay you twenty bucks to pull your four wisdom teeth. Um, I, I really would. I mean, I, I that's my goal. It's five yeah. minutes. It's totally <laughs> fun. But when they fail a wisdom tooth uh, FA, then I decide right then, like, well, you know what? You know, you're on hard luck. You know what? I'm just going to do it for free. But I know it's charity. And yeah. I know that the NFL is entertainment. But I think a lot of people don't realize that all that political bullshit is just entertainment because there's nothing they're going to do to change the course of Putin, North Korea, the election. And no matter sure. who you vote for, I mean, I've voted uh, since I was 18. On my first vote was for Ronald Reagan in 1980. And uh, no matter who you vote for, they're a lying, cheating politician, and they're going to let you down. So go work on something that you can change in your home and your business, not in D.C. and China and Russia and all that stuff, because it's just you yeah. don't realize it's entertainment and it's really stressing you out and you're not fun to be around when you're on that shit. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And also we need to seek to create more rather than consume. And we're in a society that is all about consuming and we're not building anything, we're not doing anything, and the things that are not important and not urgent, they have no relevance in five minutes, much less five or 10 or 15 years. And so it's the things that are important but not urgent, those are the things that we need to be spending time on, things that build a legacy, things that make a difference. Um, so so there you go. Not and, politics. And if you're an environmentalist, <laughs> then uh, be a real environment. Every, every kid comes born with, what, 9,000 metric tons of carbon so you know you don't have to re so recycling your Dixie cup is the answer. It's it's just having one less kid. On that note, I'll let you go. Yeah, thanks, man. All right, buddy. Appreciate you. See ya.